Good evening and welcome to the first webinar in our new series for education professionals, Tourette Syndrome, Managing OCD and Anxiety in School. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Specialist, and I will be your moderator this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During the webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. This webinar has been accredited for one contact hour for psychologists and social workers. For more information on how to obtain your credit, please download the learner notification document that is, can be found in the handout section of the control panel. In order to receive your certificate, you must participate in the entire webinar and then follow the instructions on that document. In addition to that, the slides for the presentation, along with a few of TAA's educational toolkits, are also available for download. One of those include the Education Professionals Toolkit, and that is very helpful for psychologists, social workers, and of course, our school educators. So before we get started, I want to briefly introduce our speaker this evening. Brian Lane is a public school administrator and educator with 25 years of experience at all levels. He is currently a member of the Education Advisory Board and the Diversity Committee for the Tourette Association of America. Brian serves as the seventh grade team leader and choral theater director at Stony Brook Middle School in Indianapolis, Indiana. Brian has previously been an assistant principal, dean of students, and behavior specialist for several years in Indiana and Florida. He's an award-winning choral music and theater educator, clinician, certified vocal music educator, guest conductor, performer, and organist with experience teaching choral music and theater throughout Indiana and Florida. Without further ado, you may go ahead with your presentation, Brian. Thank you, and obviously I need to update that because as you were reading that, I just realized it's actually my 27th year and uh, I officially feel old. Uh, but I want to thank everyone. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I really enjoyed doing these presentations and uh, uh, I've done them for a few years for the Tread Association and um, it's always great to educate folks and to help others learn. I will apologize right away because I do have a 10 month old dog who doesn't like it when I talk and I am I do live alone. So he gets very upset if I don't give my full attention. So if you hear him barking or squeaking or anything, uh, I will uh, ask for your your uh, your forgiveness early. Um, with that, I have set my timer so that I will know and make sure I leave time for questions or comments at the end. If there's something that is very pressing in the middle, I believe the chat is going to be monitored because I can't really see it. Um, while I'm doing the presentation. So hopefully if there's something that's that's pressing that you need right away, or uh, if you wanna hold it till the end, that's great. Um, I'm happy to answer anything I can. And if I don't know the answer, I will find it for you and make sure I get back with you. Uh, that said, uh, as she explained, I am a school administrator and educator, <clears throat> and I do have Tourette syndrome and OCD and anxiety and on and on and on and on as i'm sure many of you on here may already be aware of how the tourette world works but you're just interested in hearing more and i am more than happy to to help with that uh, i was diagnosed when i was seven years old it was a very fluke diagnosis uh, i actually went into the doctor for something totally different and uh, he was a new doctor out of um, medical school and he noticed the things that were happening and I ended up getting a diagnosis. So it was, it's, it was pretty interesting um, and have had Tourette my entire life, ticks my entire life. It is a lifelong uh, disorder as, as most of you know, or many of you may not know. Um, it is something that uh, comes and goes, waxes and wanes, as you know, when I, and I know that the doctors often say, you know, when your child grows up, it will, it will go away. Um, 
I just, I can be living proof that that is not totally true. Um, I will tell you that when I went to college, it did kind of subside a bit, but uh, soon after college, uh, my, first, my first bachelor's degree, um, it came back full force and has been here worse and better at times through since that time and i i turned 50 last year so uh it's it's still going strong after all these years um but you learn to live with it you still succeed and you work hard to to make sure uh, you achieve your dreams so i'm going to try to make sure that that i make a lot of connections here with with tourette and then ocd and anxiety and i really was excited when this is the one that uh was discussed about me doing. I've never really done one about managing just OCD and anxiety in school. And, you know, we are in the middle of one of the most anxious and concerning times in our world's history. I'm not even going to say our nation's history with, with the pandemic and COVID and trying to learn from home, trying to teach online, especially choir and theater are, are two very interesting things to do. But, uh, you know, we can get through it <clears throat> and uh, I, I hope that what I do today will help shed a little light on that. So a teacher's perspective, I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. And I like the word frightening, by the way. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child will be humanized or dehumanized. And I really want you to think about that last couple of lines there. In all situations, it is my response that decides, period. I'm just gonna stop it right there because that's the way it is. Um, I think what you're going to learn here and, and, and hear from me a lot is how important it is to learn how to react, learn how to work with these young people. And uh, I, I don't just mean the elementary students. And I know often, I feel like often Tourette is, is you know, when it comes to the school setting is really focused on that younger area and it it is it needs to go all the way through. So. Um, I think that's a great quote, and I actually have that quote on my wall at school um, because it is so true. Uh, yes, we all have bad days. I I'll be real honest with you, today was one of those days for me at school. Uh, I it was a struggle. Uh, I, I literally had an anxiety attack this afternoon, and I'm, I'm going to share that with this morning, and I'm going to share that with you here in just a few minutes. So. Let me just give you, if you're not sure, I'm guessing many of you are, but if you're not sure, I just wanted to give you what the quote unquote technical criteria for Tourette is. And it's it's both motor tics and one or more vocal, both multiple motor tics, sorry, and one or more vocal tics that have been present usually throughout a year, but during the illness, although not necessarily concurrently, a tick is a sudden rapid recurrent non-rhythmic <coughs> motor movement or vocalization. The ticks may wax and wane in frequency, but have persisted for more than one year since the first onset. Onset is before the age of 18, and I will tell you there are a lot, that's, I put an asterisk by that one, and I don't believe this is the time to go into that, but, uh, you know, if you have questions about that one, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm just going with what uh, the fifth edition of the DSM is used. Uh, disturbance is not due to the direct physiological effect, or, yeah, phys ah, I can't talk, psychological effects of a substance like cocaine or a general medication or medical condition like stroke or Huntington's disease uh, and so on. So some of the CDCs and other sources, I, I or CDC, I got some of these from the CDC as well as some other sources that I have used uh, over the years. One in approximately 164 have Tourette syndrome. Other studies show one in 100 may have Tourette's or a tick disorder. <clears throat> Approximately half of the children with with TS experience the comorbid ADHD. Um, I have it's it's interesting. I have met more and more recently uh, young people. Could do a couple of mentoring groups that 
It was really interesting, and I'm 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 curious. I'm I'm a I'm a researcher as an administrator and teacher. I always want to find out new things and and find the data. But that's something I'm going to be actually following up on this year and and next with some of those those folks. Sixty three percent have have been reported as having mild forms of the condition. Thirty seven percent are moderate to severe. Boys are three to five times more likely to have TS than girls. And I think I want to comment on that one too because if you you do go on social media or if you, if you do talk with folks or, or watch you know TikTok or whatever or even youtube whatever it may be it's interesting that the girls that females are more willing to open up or assigned female at birth i should say are more willing to open up than the gentlemen which you know that's generally true anyway uh children with ts are five times more likely to require sped services 59 percent need at least support or sped services and non-Hispanic white children are twice as likely to have a TS diagnosis as Hispanic and non-Hispanic black children. Some of the complex symptoms the difficult, that are difficult to recognize, support, and understand is that it's more than just the ticks. There's so much more. And we're going to really delve into a couple of those areas. Um, and actually, and this is one of the things that <clears throat> when I share with my students or with others about Tourette, the first question that comes up, obviously, because of the media that in the world we live in, is uh, the coprolalia. The twelve percent have the coprolalia. It, it the media glorifies that because that's that's the attention getter. But <clears throat> I have been around a lot of people with Tourette, and I I truly agree with that twelve percent. Um, it, it may be a bit more, uh, but I would say a lot of them don't have the culprinelli that sticks around. Symptoms change. They wax and wane over time. They are neurological, but may appear to be purposeful. So you might see them do something that, that looks like they're supposed to do it. Uh, um, uh, because it's not something we can stop <coughs> or help. The ability to suppress is inconsistent and variable depending on the individual. I can tell you that I struggled most of my life until I learned how to play the game, sort of, and find other ways to to move things around and to to suppress the ticks. And I can go if I work really hard at it about two hours, which is good for me um, as a, as an educator. Um, <clears throat> but that's about it for me. And then it's usually pretty ugly if if you are. If you have someone that you know that has Tourette or or a, a child that has Tourette, you you will know that holding them in is usually not the best thing because it usually becomes pretty ugly after that. The symptoms are a response to the psychological urges similar to a, an itch or the strong need to uh, um, eye blinking. I mean, you do that without even thinking, and that happens a lot with ticks. Uh, I will have people point out <clears throat> ticks to me. And I'm like, I didn't even realize I did it because I've been doing it, you know, for so long, in some cases, more than uh, 45 years. Um, and it's interesting at the time we're living in, um, I, I, I'm sure that if you uh, know of someone with Tourette or have, have someone that you care about that has Tourette, that <clears throat> in the world of COVID, clearing your throat, coughing, that kind of stuff, people automatically think, oh my goodness, this person <clears throat> has COVID. I actually have a shirt that says, uh, it's just a tick, I'm not, I don't have COVID. Um, and in fact, I'm a, I'm a part-time EMT and uh, volunteer firefighter, and uh, I've already had my, my uh, uh, yeah, I can't think of the word, vaccination, sorry, uh, both vaccinations. So um, it's, it's, it's how that, people will look at you very weird. <clears throat> um, but I'm always willing to help educate, and obviously I don't wear that shirt all the time, but um, it, was a, it's, it was a fun shirt to buy. Uh, and the biggest thing here is the only thing consistent about Tourette is the inconsistencies. It, it, it's changing so much. It always changes, and, and it's an ever-changing um, disorder. It is different in every person. And that is where I think a lot of the confusion and the misunderstanding and even the hesitation and I, I, I venture to say scariness in others. Um, it's not like a lot of other 
I mean, even using the COVID, that you usually have a fever. There's all kinds of things that, that, that go through that you can check off to know if you have that. Tourette is not that way. Because um, <clears throat> what I do or what I have is different than what someone else has. Now, I will say, and it's down there in the red at the bottom, sy symptoms can be very suggestible. Uh, I've picked up so many ticks over the years from other tickers. And uh, one of the greatest things is I used to work at a uh, Tourette camp in just outside of Chicago. And you know, we all came in with our own <clears throat> ticks at the beginning of the year and by, or beginning of the week. And by the end of the week, uh, we were all doing about, about the same thing. It was interesting how we shared each other's uh, ticks and, uh, and uh, situations. And of course, stress or high emotional uh, um, situations will increase those symptoms. Oops. And I, I, I've always included this in my presentation since it came out because I think I still think uh, from the Tourette Association this is the best description of Tourette syndrome. You know, you've got the vocal and motor tics that everybody sees, and like an iceberg, you got everything underneath there, including the anxiety and uh, OCD that we're going to be talking about. And I want to point out, if you look at the bottom right, kind of over on the side, uh, on the east coast, should I say, if you're looking at a map. It does say obsessive compulsive behaviors. It doesn't say disorder. And I want to plant that in your mind right now, because that's one of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about here uh, in just a few minutes. So the common related disorders, uh, it the CDC estimates that 86% of diagnosed that are diagnosed with TS also have another mental, behavioral, mm -hmm. or developmental condition. Um, I have yet to meet anyone in my many, many years of ticking and Tourette's, I guess is a good word, that does not have something else. Um, and we're going to talk about two of the most common, uh, the anxiety and yeah. the uh, OCD or OCB. Um, and then, of course, ADHD is also very, very prevalent. Uh, more than one third of people with TS also have obsessive compulsive disorder down there at the bottom. So why is this happening? An accurate diagnosis is critical for developing an appropriate intervention plan. Excessive movement, tapping, wiggling, standing up. Um, is it, you know, what is it? We're looking for what area this all kind of goes into. So these kind of things, is it a tick? Is it the ADHD? Is it the OCD or OCB? Is it the anxiety that's causing this? Those are the kind of things that, that we need to try to get to. Taking shoes off, chewing on objects, um, clothing is a big thing. Is that a sensory thing? Is that an anxiety thing? Is that an obsessive thing? Uh, shouting out comment, <clears throat> comments and answers rarely are we quiet. No one does not follow instructions. Uh, these are all things that it could be a part of. Sloppy handwriting is a very, very big one. I have terrible handwriting. I always apologize to my students when I, when I write. Um, Notes are not even usually messy, the most of them I've seen. Uh, they are just like chicken scratch or, or old Sanskrit or something like that. So a lot of students refuse to write because it is frustrating and it is hard. Uh, is that dysgraphia? Is that, again, obsessive? You see that one a lot in here, the OCD or the OCB. Um, perfection, doesn't like change, uh, those kind of things. What is that? Is that the OZ, OCB? D or B and anxiety, difficult transitioning. Again, you see the OCD, the anxiety, slow to respond and or impolite responses to requests. What is that issue? And so on and so forth. Um, now, let's, let's kind of break this down and get into the meat of what we're here for. Tourettic Obsessive Compulsive Disorder or OCD, uh, and I'm going to say OCB because it is truly more of a behavior, in my opinion, than a disorder. And this is something I've learned over the years from some of my other EAB colleagues. Um, and I'm at first I was skeptical and I've definitely bought into it. And, you know, I, I, I want to really try to help you understand the difference between the classic OCD and Tourette's OCD or, if you will, obsessive compulsive behaviors. In classic OCD, symptoms are linked with ritual compulsive behaviors in order to manage the anxiety related to the obsessions. Constantly checking, uh, making sure the light switches are on and off just right, uh, cleaning, um, trying to think of some of the others there, uh, rituals, uh, different things like that are the classic OCD that we see. Um, 
and you know people don't don't touch me and things like that now i'm not to say i'm not trying to say that those with tourette don't have some of those symptoms but it's a little bit different than the classic uh ocd that, that we're used to learning about when we were younger and um in theoretic ocd or like i said obsessive compulsive behavior the symptoms overlap and i think that's very important to know that more closely with the experience of the ticks that there is a need to do or say things in a certain way or time or until things feel just right i cannot emphasize that enough in my case um, and again, I, I can't speak for others who have Tourette because like I said, it's so different for everybody. But the number three is a very, very popular number among many OC beers or Tourette OC beers. And for me, it is everything I do. Um, in fact, I actually had to add an extra slide when I was creating the presentation because it was, uh, I had 26 slides and I needed either 27 or go back to 24. I, I couldn't leave it at 26. Uh, the things like the volume on the TV have to be divisible by three. I teach and set up my lessons divisible by three. Um, students don't realize this, but I do because I have to do it that way or it doesn't feel right and I get really, really anxious that's where that that overlap starts happening and again we're going to be talking about that really soon uh, as we go through this presentation so in other words the behavior is driven by an urge rather than by the fear which is true for most classic ocd they're afraid something's going to happen if they don't do blah um, and with the teretic ocd it's it's just that it's it's the kind of the opposite um, yes there there may be the fear but it's that feeling of doing it right. And <clears throat> I do almost all of my ticks in groups of three. And you you need to do them until till they feel You know, Tourette's OCD, like I said, represents a combination of obsessive compulsive and tick symptoms that may pose challenges, even with the treatment or the conceptualization or the assessment. Um, persons suffering with Tourette's OCD show symptom uh, profiles that are varied from tick-free OCD. Um, that means the patient with TOCD are less likely to have obsessions and compulsions, like I said, that relate to those things uh, as opposed to those with tick-free OCD. Um, they're more likely to show tick-like impulsions, uh, including tapping, touching. I have a very bad touching tick. Uh, a rubbing behavior. I rub my nose a lot. I used to rub it to the point where it would be, be raw and uh, bloody, but I've kind of been able to to switch some of that. But the touching and being even is very, very important for me. Um, but again, it's not that it's not that fear that something's going to go wrong. It's that it has to feel right. I have that need to do it. a certain and so although you know impulsions have some common characteristics with obsessions and 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 compulsions they are very rarely done to lessen the anxious arousal and they lack cognitive and goal uh directedness that are typical with tick-free ocd and uh in some of the research i was doing i found this venn diagram which i think is a very very good um chart if you will, about Tourette syndrome, you know, you have the ADHD, which really struggles with really reflects the organizing, the planning, the sequencing, the attention, uh, decision making, the memory, the process. And you can see the overlap happening. Obsessive behavior, distractibility, reading and writing becomes a problem. Look at that center. It's all distracting. And that's where we have to find ways to kind of fix this somehow and i'm going to come up with i'm going to give you some strategies here before we get done to try to help get us back to where we need to be um so some of the interferences with learning are you, we're, we're obsessed with symmetry and exactness um we've got to do it till it feels right and that can be so distracting that sometimes it 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 uh causes the learning not to happen um the teacher gets blanked out because we're so focused on the symmetry and exactness that needs to be done. We feel the urge to do and redo activities and ticks to achieve a feeling of completion, looking or feeling or sounding, et cetera, adjust right, like we've talked about. It can cause serious distress and is time consuming, um, <clears throat> especially like when I have a tick attack. Um, it can last up to an hour and that's it. That's all I, that's all I can focus on. Um, and the problem is after it's over, I'm done for a while. 
And, and this happens, happens so much, especially in the school setting with young people who are still trying to figure things out in life and who are still trying to learn to deal with all of this. And so uh, by what's going on inside of them with, with the Tourette and the OCD, um, that that kind of becomes everything and then the education becomes secondary. The intrusive thoughts and performing the compulsive behaviors are definitely interfering with everything. Um, like I said, if, if I, I have intrusive thoughts about different things and then that becomes an obsession to a degree and it causes me to form to perform some more compulsive behaviors. And we can become very anxious if the symptoms are obvious to others. Uh, that's definitely one of the biggest issues, especially with young people. Um, none of us want to feel or be different. We want to be like everyone else. And that is a huge struggle, especially with young people with the OCD and OCB and then the ticks. It brings that unwanted attention uh, if it is obvious to others, and that happens so often. Uh, um, of, the, of, of us, and I'm going to include me, have learning difficulties related to math and language perceptions and comprehension difficulties. And I find that interesting because math is one of my worst subjects, and I struggled with language uh, comprehension when I was younger. Um, but math I hate, which is ironic because you know I've shared with my students many times that what I teach and what I have three degrees in, besides my administrative degree, is uh, music, which is nothing but math with notes and things like that. And uh, it's it's interesting how that I can't relate to one, but I can relate to the other. And we often find that those with uh, Tourette or these kind of problems um, or these kind of issues, I should say excel in like the performing arts or the uh, the related arts and things like that. When I am performing, I just sang the national anthem at a, uh, a professional hockey game last Friday. I had zero ticks while I was performing. So every time I do that, I don't tick. When I act on stage, I don't tick. And the things I've learned is when I'm in front of folks teaching or you know things like that, I try very hard to pre pretend like I'm an actor and I'm, I'm doing my my teaching and my presentations as an acting job. And if I start to focus like that, then I can control uh, my tics, and in some cases they even go away for a while until I realize, hey, I am me. Um, and I threw this in there at the bottom that that parentheses understand that the students may actually be learning more than you realize um, especially with teachers you know they always think that those of us who struggle with this kind of uh, issue these kind of issues just aren't learning anything because we're so so focused on doing other things and not paying attention but you know I am by no means the smartest person in the world but I am an amazing multitasker and that wasn't true when I was younger um, most of us, can probably relate to some executive function issues with many of our young people with Tourette, but they're actually probably retaining and learning things more than you may realize. And that will come through later. And I don't want you to feel like, oh man, just because they're really struggling and the teacher doesn't understand and I don't understand and, and little Susie or Johnny don't understand that they're gonna be a failure in life. That's not true. Uh, again, I'm by no means the wealthiest person in the world, but I'm very happy with what I what I have been able to accomplish. Um, grew up in a rough home, and one of the things I decided early on was that I would always try to do anything that I really wanted to. And over my career, like I said, I've been an educator, I've been a performer, uh, I've been a like she she mentioned several things that I've done. I shared with you, I'm an EMT and volunteer firefighter currently. Uh, I was a part-time police officer for 10 years. Uh, I sold funeral. Uh, plots and caskets and, and dealt with services like people in, in death. I, I have done everything I've ever thought was interesting. Um, and currently right now I'm working on my doctorate. Uh, I finally started my dissertation and I'm slowly going to get there hopefully before uh, I get too old. But I do I've always had for myself and now at 50 I feel like I'm getting close to accomplishing that. Um, and it doesn't matter what physical health, mental health, emotional health issues you have. Um, don't let the Tourette or the OCD or OCB or the anxiety stand in the way. 
you know, some of the strategies that will help students learn better and these self-calming techniques, these are things I have used many times, the belly breathing, the deep breathing. I do that all the time. On my school computer, I have a little piece of a post-it note that says 90 on it. When I'm really struggling, I look at that and remind myself, okay, I need to take 90 seconds just for me and do some deep breathing and try to make uh, the muscle relaxation, giving yourself uh, some kind of you know shoulder rub if you need. It's always great. Um, guided imagery so you're thinking of the positive things or the good things or the things that help you calm down i've recently with the world of TikTok, have really gotten into some yoga techniques and i'm telling you they're really helping and as much as i hate to say this i do go to therapy i have i've recently really ramped up my therapy and it is very helpful to to help with my anxiety uh and and my ocd um, the meditation, some kind of calming box. Many students have that at their, their uh, schools, something that will work for them. Taking a break, and you're going to see that in just a second, about going to a buddy teacher or something like that. So anxiety plus OCD and OCB plus TS really is the three-headed monster. And, um, you know, anxiety and OCD go hand in hand with the TS. Um, I don't know of anybody who doesn't get become anxious, I, even if they're not clinically diagnosed with anxiety, uh, I am. Um, my anxiety is usually pretty high and goes higher um, because I go back to who sent me, what happened next because I'm, I'm concerned because that's just part of it. You know, one of these things, and this is what I really like, one of these feeds off of the other and then that increases in intensity as it grows. And like I said, I started off today with a really bad day and I actually emailed them, the, 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 the two folks that helped organize this and I said, look, I, I'm gonna add some stuff in there. I'm not quite ready yet. And I had a whole nother slide in there and everything like that and I took it out I thought, no, I'll just tell this a story. I struggled, I, I had a, a run in with my principal this morning. Um, it did not go well, it did not end well. It, and throughout the day, it's just one of those days, I struggled mightily and you know, we're all virtual right now, we go back to a hybrid schedule next uh, next week, and my students could sense there was something off with me today. And you know, they all know. I that's the, for one of the very first things that I share with them is about my Tourette and and the other conditions that I have with it, and how anxiety and how if I get angry with them or say something I shouldn't, it's nothing personal. And we have a great relationship because of that. Um, but these kind of feed off each other. Like I said, it is that three-headed monster. Monster, uh, the ticks usually often stronger, harder ticks, and then of course that gets back to everybody's looking at me again. Then the anxiety kicks in. Then the obsessive behaviors start to kick in about you know how I have to do things. And like I said, it just grows and grows and grows until the explosion happens. And that's where we kind of get into the anxiety. You know, the anxiety is always the enemy of intelligence. Um, the minute anxiety arises, intelligence closes to search for anything that relieves the anxiety. Once I get to a level, and like I said, I got there today, I actually had to not do my last class. I had someone do it for me because I was having this anxiety attack, and I it was not good. Um, it's been a rough day, but I'm glad I'm here to being able to do this. This is actually therapeutic for me today. Um, I was really looking, this was the positive I had in today to look forward and kind of get me through that anxiety attack. But once that anxiety reaches a certain level, that's all I can do. That's all that I can focus on. And that's that's true, especially with younger folks who who still have a you know a developing brain. I just did some some professional development the other day that the brain, it, what I learned when I was younger, uh, as a younger educator, five now it's at least 30 years old that our brain is still changing and developing and uh growing to a degree so um you know some of you may be 30 for me it was a long time ago but i i think back to where i was when i was 30 and and even today how things have changed uh for me so i also like this one very well the emotional anxiety vase i know many of you've probably seen this and if we were in person i would do it all for you for real but you know, you've got to remember, we all have a vase every day. I don't care who you are. Um, and it just depends on how much water or whatever you have inside that vase 
uh, carries on throughout the day. You got to understand, just getting up out of bed is often a struggle for those of us with with the ticks and the anxiety and the obsessive compulsive. So we add a little bit of water in there, and then when it's time to get dressed, you know, the socks don't go on right. The sensory may uh, kick in. That raises my anxiety even more. And I start to feed off each other. That three-headed monster comes in. You feel a little bit more with the water. So, and then you got to get on the school bus if you're going to go into school, or you've got to find a way to get on the computer and the internet's not working. You know, this this COVID thing has given us a whole set of new unique challenges that have just keep on adding, uh, you know, liquid to that to that vase. And you know, often what teachers, and this is something I really try to stress, even to the teachers that I work with, is you have no idea what happened before that eight o'clock bell rings. Their vase may already be full and just ready to overflow the first time you say, why are you late? Take that hood off, put that phone away, and that's it. They're done for the day. Um, I got there today. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm 50 years old, 27 years into this, been an assistant principal, working on my doctorate in education, and I still have those days where that vase explodes for me. Um, doesn't happen often, but ironically, on the day I'm presenting about it, it happened. Um, so you really get a, an, an undesirable reaction or outcome. So the big question is, how do we keep that vase from overflowing? How you know we got to work with students because no one knows them better than them, and that's often forgotten, especially in like the education setting at school. Um, we have all of these people who are telling us how our son or our daughter or our child should be should be taking care of themselves and here are the strategies you've got to have because this is what i learned when i was in this special education class in college but honestly the two biggest advocates and the two people in the room that and i do mean in the room and i stress this uh, and i say this in every presentation i give i think the student should be involved in every kind of conference or meeting that you have because no one knows them and how they feel and how they deal with it better than them and you're probably number two as a parent or, or whatever and you know the teacher and and the school have to work together to help manage those issues uh how do we get that anxiety down before that vase explodes how or overflows how do we get the ocd down before they start feeding off of each other and it, it gets to the point where our the, the student can't stay in school it's it's not a behavioral issue which is so often the the issue that we find in schools it's it's something we can't help you know one of the things i include in a lot of my other presentations is you got to learn how to distinguish between i can't and i won't if if the tourette or even any student tells you i can't do this can't that's probably true. If they say, I won't do this, or I don't want to do this, that's more the behavioral side. I don't want to get off my phone because I'm playing Call of Duty right now. I can't stop making the noises because there's nothing I can do about that. And then that becomes a distraction to all the students and there's no way. So there, there are strategies to do, and I'm just going to give you a few today here as we go through this, but there are literally tons of different strategies and that's why i say you've got to involve that child and and you as the caregiver or the parent uh when it comes to trying to reduce uh that water in the vase so kinds of follow-up positive proactive supports teach and are effective punishment and consequences usually are very counterproductive and the student will shut down, this, especially the OCD, anxiety, Tourette student. There's there's no need to even try. Once once that vase is overflowing, it is very difficult to bring bring us back. And I include uh, so never assume, especially with Tourette. Figure out what it is. Is it the anxiety? Is it the OCD or OCV? Is it the ADHD? Is it the, the tics? And I talked to you already about my morning example. So some of the strategies don't allow them to assume. Assumptions are not always accurate or helpful. Uh, teachers, caregivers will often say it's they're just trying to seek attention. Uh, they're just doing this on purpose. Um, they just like pushing my buttons. Uh, they're just defiant and they just don't want to do anything. So they oppose me or they, they just avoid doing the work, even though they can do it. Or they are the class clown. And I will say that is me. Uh, when I was in school, I definitely was the class clown. That's how I dealt with this. I, I, I laughed about it. I made jokes about it. I got in a lot of trouble when I was in middle school and high school. 
because this was the way I dealt with what I had. Um, and of course, back in the 19, <clears throat> when I was in school, uh, there was no understanding, like there is a little bit more today, even though we still got a long way to go. Um, I was always in, off, in the office. I was always in trouble. I spent more time in detention and in trouble than I probably did in class. Um, fortunately, when I got to college, I learned some techniques and learned how to spread out my schedule. And I try to advocate for that now. Um, I think it's in important that, or interesting that when I got to the point where I could kind of control my own learning, um, I did a better job. Uh, I've never had any issues with grades in college. I've been very successful. I'm not trying to brag on myself because I was not a good student in the organized, old school school system that we still follow in this country. One of the positives, if there are any out of this COVID thing is I think we're starting to realize there are other ways to do school. And some of those other ways might be helpful for some folks like us. And so, like I said earlier, include the young person in the decision making, the accommodations and advocate for themselves so that when they do go to college, they know what to do so that when they are you know, adults, they know how to deal <clears throat> and talk with people who give them those dirty looks because they're coughing during the middle of a pandemic. So what are some behaviors or symptoms of communicating other than ticks? They're bored. A lot of students engage in this challenge behavior because they're bored, because they're tired. Um, now, recently I've gotten on some sleep medication and it's been better, but you know, one of the things I've said a lot of times in my meetings, uh, and one of the things I always ask parents or, or or the, the students with threat is how are they sleeping at night? You would be amazed at how bad it is. I functioned, I have functioned most of my life on two, possibly three hours of sleep every single day. And I do all these other jobs too. And it's, people are like, how can you, how can you do that? I'm like, that's because that's the way I've learned to, to deal with it. But there are times I'm, I'm fatigued and we feel very overwhelmed because we're dealing not only with just <clears throat> the work, or the, the social aspect of school, the academic acts, aspect of school, we're dealing with all these other things as well. Um, so it's, it's important to recognize those as, as caregivers and as, as teachers and as uh, school staff. You know, the feeling of failure, the deep pit of failure, I can't see the light, at, any of the light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, I think, again, I go back to COVID, that's something we've felt a lot this year. And I know when I went in for that very first uh, vaccination, I literally cried. And the energy inside that area was amazing. As an EMT, I have dealt with more death over the past year than I have in my previous 31 years of being an EMT. And it was miserable and dark to walk into an emergency room or to into a hospital or into a home where an elderly person just gave up because they didn't want to die in the hospital. Um, but there's light at the end of the tunnel and that feeling of failure has has kind of awakened many of us through this this time and that's something that many of us have felt for many many years these neurological conditions. Um, but like I said when I walked in for that very first time literally tears came my chills came over me. Um, and the staff, the, the teachers, or the teachers, the nurses and, and the healthcare workers were just beaming with joy for the first time in so long. Um, the frustration, we had this sensory overload. We were kind of talking about that earlier. We often struggle with poor planning skills. We don't know what to do first or next. Um, and that kind of goes along with some of these other things we're talking about. Uh, we have specific or generalized skills deficits. There's a shush, sorry about that. There, we, we kind of tend to respond to a symptom uh, with the OCD instead of responding to the overall problem, that three-headed monster, rather than just dealing with one of those heads. You know, we want to fit in. Uh, we do desire, they desire an issue and causes a lot of this anxiety. Um, I still don't have a lot of friends. I have two friends I consider very close to me. Um, and that's two more than I had when I was growing up, to be honest with you. Um, and it's hard because, you know, we all want to fit in. Stop. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, sometimes, you know, we just feel like it's better to be seen by our peers as bad or weird, so we give up. I go back to mine when I was talking about the, the being the class clown. So some accommodation examples for the monster. You know, create easier 
transitions. This is a huge struggle so often with people and I, with young people and with those of us who have anxiety and OCD and, and how it all kind of works together there with the Tourette. And I'm not just talking about at school, I'm talking about at home, I'm talking about in life. Um, try to help the young person or the, the person that we're talking with, you know, figure out easier transitions. If they're in school, give them preferential seating. Often it's in the back because they want to be hidden. Um, but that's okay, uh, as long as we're able to pay attention. That helps calm them down. Find a safe place in a person. I, that's something I, I wish I would have had in school. You know, I, being diagnosed, diagnosed at seven in, in the 70s was very, very rare. And so <clears throat> I had no one to go to or no one to talk to about this. And it was something I just had to learn to deal with myself until when I was a senior in high school, I found the Tourette Association uh, and went to my very first conference in many, many years ago. You know, working with those organizational skills, we've kind of talked about that. We need to make sure there's a routine. We need to give them extra time for things. Privacy, you know, if we're taking a test <clears throat> and the student is really ticking and becoming anxious because they know they're being watched and they're disrupting other people, let them go somewhere uh, to take that test giving them the less directions and tasks. And, you know, executive functions are hugely a, a huge issue uh, in this world that we, we deal with. Um, so reducing the amount of tasks they have on the work that they have to do usually will help with some of that. Help them work with a friend. And I put friend in quotes because it needs, it's a great way to develop a friendship. And like I was saying, it's often difficult for those of us who struggle with this to make or even keep friends stop um and the most the most important things is to educate the other teachers staff administrators students and parents you know observe for patterns that work with the caregivers and the parents and share those with that with the others who work with the children stop so that's really important focus on the quality and not the quantity of work that is extremely important remember that every student with Tourette is different and different and I shared that at the very beginning and I often include this one too in most of mine uh, is it rude or are we communicating when asked what adults can do during a rage episode or during the times when these become more of an issue the majority of children with TS said stop talking to me one of the things we do as caregivers one of the things we do as parents one of the things we do as teachers is try to help we're trained to help the young people The best we can one of the things we want to do is talk with them try to talk them through it a lot of times they just need to be left alone you know focus on the positives in these students and plug those strengths into their accommodations in academic and social strategies uh you know the platinum rule is it is important to focus on what we can do for the student prior to the behavior instead of what we do uh what do we do to them after the behavior has occurred it's so important that we take care of it at the beginning before it happens create those relationships learn what works try to get some of those strategies in place before it becomes a problem um, and my final concluding thought here I, i'm right on time with what i want to do to leave question time your child's mental health is more important than their grades always getting them through everything persevering and building that self-esteem is a primary goal for everyone not just young people so with that there's a lot that Association. I encourage you to check them out if you have not already done so. Uh, I love working with them and being an advocate for them. And here are my, here's the information to get to the Tourette Association. And there are lots of articles and lots of content on there. Some of the stuff that I talked about here is even research I did there. So, and there's my contact information. You can feel free to talk to me anytime, send me an email, give me a call. That's my business cell. So you can call or text anytime. And with that, I will turn it back over to our host for any questions. And again, I apologize for my mean, nasty puppy who has been disres disrespectful to our time. Stop. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. No problem about the dog. <laughs> he probably had enough of you at the end there, but that's okay. Um, we got through it. So thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, we are now going to begin answering any questions that were submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still do so um, through the questions pane on your control panel. Feel free to drop any questions in there. Um, we'll get to them. If we don't get to everyone's question, um, you can reach out to the TAA um, and we can do a follow-up with Brian as well. Um, so the first question I have, Brian, 
not sure if you're able to answer this one. Um, maybe it's something we can table for later, but due to the difference between classic OCD versus the Tourettic OCD, do you have a recommendation for therapy? CBIT or ERP? I will not advocate for one of the others, uh, and I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, a lot of people work with CBIT and it works for them. A lot of people work with other types of therapy. I tried medication under the sun. It does not usually work for me because it usually wears off. Um, so I would feel uncomfortable advocating for one or the other. I go back to what I said earlier about it being different for everyone. I know some folks who have really benefited from the CBIT. Um, again, I tried it and it didn't work for me. So. Um, I would encourage you, one of the first things I did when I found my therapist, I told them what's going on and this is some of the things. So, you know, I found a therapist who knew about Tourette's, who knew how to work with Tourette's, who knew how to work with obsessive compulsive disorder uh, and behaviors and that and the anxiety and that has made all the difference. But as far as advocating, it's hard for me to do that for one or the other. Great, thank you, Brian. Does that answer that question, question, I hope? Yes, definitely. If you, if whoever answered the question, if you're interested in learning more about CBIT or, or anything else, please just check out the website and you can always reach out to us for some more clarification on what may be the best for your case. Um, so the next can question. I encourage you to try it. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. I said, I encourage you to try it. Try anything, you know, until you find something that works. That's what I did for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right, the next question we have, as an upcoming college student with TS, what can I do beforehand to make sure I can be accommodated before entering? Reach out to the office, uh, usually of student affairs. They have a division that works with that. Um, definitely always talk to your professors. That's something that I always learn to do. Um, most professors are a lot easier to work with than the teachers in high school. They're not as rigid. They're very accommodating. They're very understanding. Um, but those are two things I always encourage college students to do. I, I've taught several college classes and I, you know, again, I'm very honest with them up front. Challenges are a unique set of experiences. And I've had students come to me and say, hey, I have huge anxiety. And here we are sitting in a class of 400 people. Um, sometimes they just need that break. But I have found that the college level, especially going into it, they're much more accommodating and much more willing to work with you. And I'm not trying to belittle our education system because I'm a part of it and have been for many, many years. It just seems like they have a little bit more flexibility and time. They aren't just, they aren't as constrained by many of the state and local laws and federal laws that we have to follow in the public schools. So most, like I said, most universities that, that I have talked to or colleges do have an office for that. Um, I know there are instances where there are issues um, and some students, uh, there's been some national news recently where some students have, have struggled, but um, that's definitely the exception and the rarity. Um, I encourage you to reach out and talk with someone. Uh, again, and I'm not trying to, I'm not being paid by the Trade Association or anything to advocate for them, but I encourage you to go on, on their website. I know there are specific articles and specific items geared towards the college level student. Yes, absolutely. Next question I have, what would some accommodations be for a student who has dysgraphia or dysgraphia-like symptoms in elementary school? That's a tough one because it's it's hard to, to work through the dysgraphia. Um, <clears throat> like for me, it's just something I had to keep on practicing. Um, Again, I did not have a good childhood, so I didn't have anyone there to give me the examples. But, you know, even as I got older, um, I have, I still, I journal a lot and that helps me. Um, that's one of the things I've always done because I cannot write well. I cannot, I have terrible handwriting. I assume that's what we're talking about here. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, tell me. Uh, but uh, those are the kind of things that I think help, you know, it's like anything, you know, as a singer, as a performer, I have to practice to get better. And it's that that same way. It's very frustrating at times. It's very tedious at times. It's very, you know, you, if you don't give up and you keep on trying, uh, it, it can help. Um, one of the accommodations that's nice nowadays, especially what we've learned here, is asking for a Chromebook, asking for a laptop that they can use or an iPad, whatever might work, instead of having to 
to write it all out. Um, that's a great accommodation to, to ask for in a meeting or in, in some kind of, you know, even if you're not going for the whole IEP or 504 plan, you know, just working with the school on that, knowing that it, that writing is a struggle. Um, I hope that kind of addresses that. Mm -hmm, I think so. Okay, we have quite a few questions. So next one, I have a student who has okay. TS as well as intermittent explosive disorder. His tics are more verbal mm -hmm. outbursts than that are quite yeah. violent in nature. These come out when he is super anxious, but it is hard to s distinguish between the two. Any suggestions? And that goes back to kind of what I said earlier. It is hard to distinguish between the two. One of the things I would encourage you to do is definitely to reach out to the student, definitely reach out to the parent, uh, you know, depending on what, I don't know what grade level we're looking at here or age we're looking at, um, but I, I would definitely, work with as many people as you can that, that care for or work with this this student um, I would learn to ask the I to figure out the I can't versus I won't type or I don't want to type thing um, that's where you start to figure out in my opinion uh, and in my experience of working with this that's where you start to figure out the difference between what is a behavior issue, what is not. It's very difficult to find, and it's very difficult to find that line, especially when they are explosive tics, and you know you have maybe even the oppositional defiant disorder. Um, you, you need to get a professional involved if you can, uh, but that's, again, giving them those reasonable accommodations, the, the preferential seating, their tasks, and being able to let them go somewhere to do that uh, sometimes can be helpful. But again, using the strategies that, that work for that child. Like I said, everyone is different. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Great, thank I know you. It's kind of my big answer. Hard. Yeah, that's okay. Next question. How do you deal with a parent or caregiver that, caregivers that are not very responsive to how to talk to their child, especially when behaviors are present and increase? Yeah. Uh, that's a tough one. And I will tell you, I work in an inner city school and have found that's my passion. Um, I started out in a very rural Amish community teaching and I am now on the east side of Indy where just this past weekend, three blocks away we had from my school, we had two shootings. Um, so I have a lot of parents and caregivers who don't respond. And that's where, uh, it's it's hard for me to say this, but that's where I really try to reach out and become almost a pseudo caregiver uh, I try to find I try to talk with that student hey is there something I can do to help you what what works for you what what helps motivate you what helps you be a better worker um, and then if if often that's when parents will start to when the grades start to go up or when the behavior starts to increase in school that's often when parents will become more engaged uh, especially in that setting where you have a demographic of parents who who just don't I don't want to say they don't care but just don't get involved uh, like they should in their child's education. Um, but I, I think that's something that's really helped me as a teacher is making those connections or, or, or as as a as a school administrator, making those connections. And like I said, developing those in that platinum rule, developing those positive relationships early. I know it's tedious, I know it's hard, and I know it's frustrating, but keep on trying to contact them every way you can. Um, I'm not saying go to their house, but uh, you know, let them know that you are there as part of their team. You want to help their child become better. Um, what can I do to help your child? I'm I'm part of you know, he, I'm here to help them become a not just a better uh, edu uh, educated student, but a better person, so that they can take an active role in society's future. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Do you have any suggestions for attempting to integrate students with TS into high school sports teams with other coaches in the league that aren't familiar with it? Education, education, absolutely. They should be able to do anything they want. Um, I would have been lost without my extracurriculars. I wouldn't be doing what I do today without being in sports. And, you know, there are literally great names throughout the sport history you know we just when we were able to do things together we we the last conference i believe we were in person for for tourette we got to meet anthony Irvin, the fastest swimmer in the world because they still haven't had the new olympics yet you know and he he grew up with tourette 
David Howard, who is perhaps one of the greatest goalies of all time. Um, getting a hold, if you feel uncomfortable educating the, the coaches or the other members of the team, get a hold of one of us, get a hold of the Tread Association. I would love to come and advocate and share my experiences as a coach. I coached basketball and baseball and golf for many, many years. Uh, I participated in varsity golf and varsity football in high school. So I highly, highly, highly encourage you to educate <clears throat> and work with those coaches to let them know, hey, this could be one of your better athletes ever because we are driven. Uh, that obsessive behavior becomes part of it. Tim Howard, I've heard him say he never would have been the goal he has been, he had been for his extensive long career if he had not had Tourette because he felt driven to be perfect and driven to do it right. And again, it made him one of the best goalies in the history of soccer. So I hope that that is a way to, to help with that. Yes, absolutely. We definitely encourage um, those of you out there who are listening to encourage your students or children to educate um, whatever group they may be coming in contact with. Um, Brian, I know we're yeah, at the hour. Do you want to take a few more questions? Oh, I can keep going. Yeah, that's fine. But one of the things I want to follow up then is what I said. Yep. That's what I said earlier, and I always include in the presentation is how this is that's a great time to teach them how to advocate for themselves you may be standing mm -hmm. there with them talking with that coach but you learned right then you know for later in life for working with teachers for when they go to college like we were just talking about with that question for when they go to an employer they know how to advocate for themselves and let them know i'm going to be okay and i'm going to work my butt off for you you just got to give me a chance great thank you um let me see here Did hey. the... Okay, we have some more personal questions, but let me pick one out for you. So this person says, okay. I have twins with TS and anxiety. One of the two has OCD and struggles with interoception. Any suggestions on accommodations for home or school to support? Um, that's, that's a toughie uh, with twins. Um, Again, I would, I would, and again, it, it, it would be helpful to know how old these, these folks are, but I, I would work with them and talk with them and start to really observe and what works to keep them focused and to keep them on tap. Uh, what incentives work? What, what, um, what techniques do they use? Do you observe them using to try to help themselves stay focused? Um, suggesting things. Uh, again, I would encourage you, and I know this is a broken record here, uh, and I even got it on there, the Tourette Resources uh, link is a great place you can find, and there are tons of accommodations. Um, any little thing, any little thing that you can get into uh, that brain and that 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 way to help that that individual will usually open another door and another door and another door. And that as they grow and develop, and as you grow and develop with them, um, you're gonna find what works and what doesn't. So again, hard question to answer because it's so individualistic and so different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so I wanna read you one long comment and question here. First off, great presentation. Okay. Your dog is adorable and you handled him or her very well. So two questions. Um, Thank you. Well, <laughs> one I'll ask I'll just say this too a lot of people have been asking if it's the webinar has been recorded and yes it has um, about 24 to 48 hours after the presentation closes out you will receive an email um, with the link to the recording so um, definitely share it out with others I'm happy to happy to have that available for you um, and then this might be a little too specific for you but do you know of any resources in the Boston area that provide therapies for specific profiles of Tourette in person, but more specifically telehealth? Um, I, I, I can probably answer this maybe a little better unless you have any connections there, Brian. But yeah, what I was going to say, I know the Massachusetts uh, group was pretty strong. And I know Mass General has a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. um, but I was getting ready to say I would reach out to the folks who are, my, or, you know, helping with this because they have those contacts that are probably better. I know a couple in a couple of folks in in Massachusetts that I've worked with before, 
But I, I am definitely going to turn it over to you to answer that because you'll be able to answer it better than me. Yes. So um, as Brian said, Mass General in Boston ha is a turret center of excellence, um, and they have many providers um, that are treating <laughs> patients with trust syndrome. So I would definitely recommend checking out our website and finding the contact person there. Um, and our Massachusetts chapter is very active um, that if you'd like to link up with more people with Tourette syndrome, then that's definitely the place to go. Um, all right. So I'll give you one more question, Brian. Fine. So this question is actually from Christine, who is one of our interns here. She's been working with us for about a year. Um, so she's wondering if you could elaborate more on how you cope with both Tourette syndrome and OCD in a school or college university setting. Are there any good techniques to help alleviate some of these symptoms? Great question. It's a question I actually have heard a lot. And as much as I, again, sound like a broken record, it's so individualistic. Um, for me, I have learned how to, like I said, one of the things I do is become an actor when I'm in front of people the best I can. Of course, talking about them, doing these kind of presentations, it's a little harder to control. Uh, but, you know, as far, I find things, I find techniques that have worked for me, especially with the OCD and the anxiety. Um, do I fail? Yeah, I go back to exactly what I was sharing about today. Today was a complete failure for me um, until I got here. And I, like I said, this has been the positive. This has been my therapy. Um, but I have learned that the deep breathing technique works for me. I share the, the yoga. I do a lot of the, the TikTok yoga thing. Um, I used to be a big calm.com thing, but I'm starting to get into, and I know this may sound a little out there, but I'm starting to get in like I'm just becoming one and more uh, stable and I'm finding that is really helping and that's that's been a suggestion from my therapist um, and I encourage therapy as much as I hate to say it uh, whether it's CBIT or whatever works for you um, I also have found and I've really increased a lot of journaling and that really is helping me cope with some of the anxiety issues and some of the the obsessive issues that I have but in the moment um, there are times I have to take a break and I, you know, I work with a, as a choir teacher and a theater teacher, I work with very closely with my other performing arts teachers. And I've actually, I have a connecting door to the orchestra room. And I said, I need to take a break for a minute. I just need to get myself under control. I need to get things back in order. And they know that. And so we work well together and she kind of just stands in the middle of the door for a couple minutes while I go take a lap or two. Um, the dog who we've all heard and been dealing with tonight is actually my service dog now. He's officially certified as my service dog, and that has definitely helped. Um, I haven't taken him a ton to school, uh, but there will be more of that as students start to return because I do need that. Today, he happened to be at school, and that actually helped me get through the day. Um, so for me, and again, I, it's for anybody, you've got to find what works for you. I, I can give you what works for me. I can tell you what works for me. I can lead you to the websites to try what they, they say, but it all comes with experimenting and learning what works for you. I hope that can help you on with that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. So thanks again for such a great presentation and for sharing all of your great insight and everything um, and answering the questions that we got. Um, it, it does look like we didn't get to them all. Um, please feel free to reach out to um, the TAA and we'd ha be happy to get those answered for you. So this and is all the time that we have for the webinar. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. My email is there no, too. No. If you want to ask me specifically, feel free. Yes, definitely. Please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer your questions. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, once the webinar is closed, um, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would be greatly appreciative if you would take a few moments and provide your feedback on tonight's presentation. This survey is specific to the experience during the webinar and will help us to improve future programming. So also, as I said, you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of the webinar. There will also be additional instructions on how to claim your credit in the email if that is something that you are interested in doing. So additionally, the webinar will be posted on the TAA's YouTube, YouTube channel for those who were unable to participate today. And we encourage you to reach out to us about this <coughs> webinar or for any ideas and suggestions you may have 
but this is just number one of five on our new education professional webinar series. So please check out the rest and join us next month on March 24th. Um, and with that, on behalf of the Chart Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view the presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you very and thank much, you everybody. Have a good one. Stay safe. Have a great evening.